Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for allowing me to preach tonight. I love to preach. You throw meat to a dog, he loves to eat. You give me an opportunity to preach, I love to do it. Thank you very much. This week we're studying around a theme. Complete in Christ. Complete in Christ. If you take your Bible, turn to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 28. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Paul here is talking about why he proclaims Jesus. He says, we proclaim him, talking about Jesus, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. So he's saying, we, we go around proclaiming Jesus admonishing and teaching every man is in the best way we possibly can so that we may present every man complete in Christ. And why is that? Well, it's because that's the only place you're going to be complete. In last night's lesson, we learned that if you have everything in the world, but you don't have God, you don't have anything. If you want to be complete, if you want to be whole, if you want to be fulfilled, if you want to be satisfied, if you want to be satiated, and we'll talk as we progress in this series of lessons, especially in the final lesson, we'll talk about a different metaphor for the same thing we're talking about. We'll talk about how a lot of people are the spiritual equivalents of dry deserts. They're thirsty, and they're looking for something to drink to satisfy them. And they look everywhere but where they can find the true living water, which is Jesus. And, 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 and as a result of that, for the rest of their lives, until they look for the fount of living waters where it is, which is in Jesus, they'll forever be thirsty, dry, brittle. So Paul here says, I go around preaching everybody, preaching Jesus to everybody because I want everybody to be complete. You can't be complete without God, but with Jesus you can be completely complete. You have everything you need. Look, if you would, in the next chapter, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Fascinating verse. In Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. When you saw Jesus on the earth, you saw in bodily form everything that made God, God. And what Jesus wants to do for us is when people see us, they want to see everything that makes people, people. That gives us the fullness of humanity just in the same sense that Jesus had the fullness of deity. Isn't that fascinating? In Him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. Just as Jesus is completely man and completely God, we can be completely what God wants us to be too. In him, in Christ. In Christ we have everything we need to have life and to have it more abundantly. It's like buying a product that requires some assembly. Don't you like those that actually give you everything you need to put it together? You don't have to go hunting for a tool or you don't have to go hunting for a screw or go to fasten all and find some strange thing you need. Every, everything you need is there. And, and that's what you have with Jesus. In Jesus, you're going to find everything you need. And tonight's formula is this. If you have God, but you have nothing else, you have everything. Last night it was, if you have everything and you don't have God, you got nothing. Tonight's lesson is, if you've got God, but that's all you have, you have everything. 
And I think it's so vital for us as Christians to understand. And we'll talk about this tomorrow in the first lesson. We need to understand that there's, there's not something we ought to be looking for in addition to what we have. We already have everything we need. And what we have to come to realize is that whatever else it is that we're looking for is the very thing that comes between us and satisfaction. Because we already have everything we need to be satisfied. We just need to recognize that and live consistent with that truth. And I think a lot of us miss that. A lot of us don't appreciate that we already have it all and we need to live consistent with that glorious truth. The way I want to proceed with tonight's lesson is, is, is a way of a memory device. I want to talk about the six P's, like in person or people or packaging or paper. The six P's of he who fills all in all. I like that phrase, and that's the way I've titled this lesson, is he who fills all in all, or God plus nothing equals everything. We're talking about a God who fills to the full all in all ways that we need. It's interesting that God describes himself that way. I am the God who fills all in all. And I want to talk about six P's that are associated with the God who fills all in all. I'll give you an example to start, and you'll, I think, understand where I'm going first. First of all, his penchant, P-E-N-C-H-A-N-T. Now, I know that's kind of a big word, but I'm trying to get six Ps, so you kind of have to stretch a little bit. But it's really an appropriate word because it means strong and continued inclination. What is God's strong and continued inclination? What is his penchant? What does he want to do? Look at Psalm 34, verse 9. Psalm 34, verse 9. And there are many good verses that we'll not read tonight for time's sake. This is last night's sermon outline. If you didn't pick one up, please do so if you'd like one. This is tonight's lesson, and I'll put it on the table so you can pick it up as you leave. Psalm 34, verse 9. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. To those who fear him, there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. But they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. That's God's penchant. Is to make sure that those who fear him are not lacking in any good thing. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 25. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 25. Here's what God wants to do. Jeremiah 31, 25. I satisfy the weary ones and refresh everyone who languishes. And literally refreshes fills. I satisfy the weary ones and fill everyone who languishes. Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Are you tired? Do you desperately seek something that you haven't found yet? Do you want what's good for what ails you? Jesus is the medicine you need. He is the answer to the problems we all have. Because he is the one who satisfies those who are weary and refreshes everyone who languishes. We've already studied a little bit about what the New Testament says about this subject, but look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11. We've looked at Colossians chapter 1 and 28, which said, if you'll recall, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. That's what God wants. He wants to present everybody complete in Christ. Then you look at Colossians 3, 3 chapter, chapter 3 verse 11 again. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11. It says, A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freeman. And here's the passage I wanted to emphasize. But Christ is all and in all. It doesn't matter who you are. There's no distinctions as to who can be complete in Christ. Whether you're rich or poor, black or white, 
whatever whatever you want to talk about. Whatever you are and maybe you feel like somehow that makes you different from somebody else and somehow that other person has an advantage over you. Not in Christ. It doesn't matter if you're Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. Whoever you are, Christ is all you need. And He is in anyone who will accept Him into their lives. So the first P is that God wants us to be filled, satisfied. He wants to take our souls that for many of them are like dry and barren deserts. I mean, think of the picture of, of, of a salt flat where the ground is just utterly, there's no moisture whatsoever and it's actually cracked. That's the way a lot of us are spiritually. And God doesn't want that. He wants to take dry and barren souls and turn them into lush and watered gardens. Look at Isaiah 58 and verse 11. Isaiah 58 and verse 11. We're looking at a lot of verses tonight, but it's the word of God and it ought to bring comfort to our hearts. Isaiah 58 and 11. Here's what the pension of God is. The Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones and you will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. You can go from being dry and barren to being lush and so fruitful that not only do you have everything you need, but you so overflow that you can bless others too. We'll look at this passage more as we proceed in this series of lessons, but I love John 7, 37. John 7, 37, if you want to look there with me. There is a theme of verses throughout the Bible talking about how God is living water and how we need to drink living water because our souls will thirst without him. We need to be satisfied spiritually in our thirst. Just just like is if, if if you're physically thirsty, you cannot you cannot be whole until that thirst is satisfied. So it is with our spirit. Man is both soul and body, spirit and flesh. And you you, you you've got to satisfy the flesh in order for the for you to be complete physically. And you've got to fulfill, give the spirit what, or the soul what it needs if you're going to be fulfilled spiritually. And that's the, the essence of this picture that runs throughout Scripture. And I love John 7, 37. It says, On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, and he's not talking about here physical thirst, he's talking about spiritual thirst let him come to me and drink he who believes in me as the scripture has said from the, his innermost being will flow living rivers of living water isn't that cool and it says but this he spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive for the spirit was not yet given because jesus was not yet glorified what jesus is saying to us is if you are hungry and you're thirsty spiritually if your soul is languishing because it's not getting the nutrients it needs, I want to give those things to you. I want to give you living waters so that instead of being that barren and dry desert, you're actually a lush and fruitful garden. Not only is there everything you need in that garden, but other people can come to your garden and be satisfied from what, your, what overflows from you. And that's why it's so important for us to take this lesson to heart. To understand that if we have God, we have everything. Because the world is desperately looking for answers to the problems that it has. And it needs to see those answers in us. If, it's, if they don't see it in us, who are they going to see it in? This is not really a series of lessons at the end of the day to make us happy people. To make us enjoy life. That, that's the byproduct of all this. The real point is that we need to be fulfilled, satisfied, happy, complete. We ought to have pleasure in life because it glorifies the God 
who ought to produce all those things in us because we have a relationship with him. The bottom line is if we have a relationship, a saved relationship with the creator of the universe, we ought to be on top of the world. We got everything. We're missing nothing. And we, we, we need to emulate that. We, we need to show that. We need to demonstrate that. We need to so live that people will, maybe they'll see us and they'll go, I don't know what's different about that person, but there's something different about them. And I want to find out what it is. And that's when we can lead them to Jesus because we have him and he's causing us to be so fulfilled that we're overflowing and they can drink from the waters we drink from as well. So God wants three things for us. He wants us to be fully satisfied. In John chapter 4 and verse 13. John chapter 4 and verse 13. Great passage in John chapter 4. Jesus was talking to the woman by the well. A Samaritan woman. And he says of the, the water that they were pouring up to drink to, to satisfy their physical thirst. He says, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. He's talking about physical thirst. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. God wants us to be fully satisfied. When you drink physical water, what happens? You gotta you gotta drink it again because you get thirsty again, right? What Jesus is saying is if you'll drink me, and it goes along with the parallel illustration of eating eating Jesus. And the idea is not literally eating him, the idea is is using Jesus as meat for your soul's sake. And what we're talking about here is is not literal drink, we're talking about using spiritual drink to satisfy our soul. And if we drink physical drink, you're going to get thirsty, so you're going to drink again. But as long as you drink Jesus, you need to keep drinking him. But as you drink him, you'll, you'll never get thirsty. So what happens physically? What happens physically is we drink and we get thirsty. So we drink and we get thirsty. We drink and we get thirsty. What do we do as Christians? We drink and we drink and we drink. But in the process of it, if we do it right, we never get thirsty again. We don't have to be up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. We can be complete in Christ always, and that's awesome and great news. We'll talk about that more in other lessons. He wants us to be utterly happy. In John 15 and verse 11, this is what God wants. This is his pension. He says, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Jesus was such a joyful person that as he was on the cross, hanging there, bleeding to death, he could turn to and look at those that had nailed him there and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's when you have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. That's, that's, that's when you are happy and joyful and fulfilled. And what Jesus says to us is, I want to teach you how to do that. And it's possible. We know it's possible because Stephen did the same thing, didn't he? When he was being stoned to death, didn't he do the same thing? And a lot of times what happens with Christians is they'll sit there and they'll say, well, yeah, but Stephen and Paul and Abraham and Moses and these guys you read about in the Bible, these, these were superhuman men and women of faith. They weren't like us. And the scripture tells us that's not the case. They, 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 had, they, they weren't exactly like us. The only difference between us and them, if they're all those things and we're not, is they they believed and they obeyed. And if we'll believe and we'll obey, something we can all do, we can, we can be the kind of people that other people put on a pedal and look up to and want to be like because we are so much like Jesus. He wants us to be fully satisfied. He wants us to have his joy. And he wants us to be completely at peace. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. It says in the latter part of that verse, May grace and peace be yours in the fullest. God wants us to be satisfied, happy, at peace. This word peace, our Irene in the Greek, it's a, it's a relationship word. Whenever you see the word peace, what you're talking about is the status of a relationship between two parties. And, and the way... The relationship ought to be is, is biblical peace. Whether you're talking about the relationship you have with yourself, the relationship you have with other people, or the relationship you have with God, what you want is peace. 
biblical peace. And why do you want that? Well, as Barclay just defined the word, he says, peace as used in this passage describes perfect welfare, serenity, prosperity, and happiness. The greeting shalom or peace does not only wish a man freedom from trouble, it wishes him everything which makes for his contentment and his good. Peace does not only describe the absence of war and strife, but peace describes happiness and well-being of life. So in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, where it says, May Greece and peace be yours in the fullest measure. What he's saying is, I want you to have the greatest possible relationship with God. Why? Because that's what makes life meaningful. You have the fruit of the Spirit, right? The nine things. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The first thing are what? Love, peace, and joy. That order is not accidental. Love is the motive for everything we do. Love is what causes us to get up in the morning, put our feet on the ground, and start walking. Because we want every step to take to be a step that's made out of love. Which basically means I, I desire the highest good for all humanity. And God himself. So if that's your motive, what are you going to do? You're going to be happy. Why? Because of peace. Peace is what love does to a relationship which results in joy. You want to be happy? Do what the Ecclesiastes writer said last night we read about. Live joyfully with the wife of your youth all the vain days that you have under the sun. You want to be happy? Be happily married. Relate the way God says to your spouse. Relate the way God says to him. You know, we have conflict within ourselves. I mean, a lot of times we're in a turmoil. Settle that turmoil down by having a relationship with yourself that's described biblically as peace. So love is what motivates us, and it's the, I want the highest good. Joy is the emotional result of love, but it happens because love affects relationships and blesses them and that's really what life is all about life is all about relationships and if we forsake and this is something we won't have more time to a lot of time to deal with in this series of lessons but if we put things above relationships with others we are totally missing the whole point of love and joy because it's about peace it's about peace so that's his pension his inclination. He wants to satisfy parched, thirsting souls. He wants Christians to be fully satisfied, utterly happy, completely at peace. That's that's the God we serve. That's what he wants. That's his pension. All right, number two. His provision. His provision. What I want to say here now is that he has done everything he possibly needs to do for us to have the peace that he wants to supply us. If you look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 10. It talks about Jesus. And it's fascinating. Ephesians 4 and verse 10 says, He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above the heavens. I'm talking about Jesus, saying that Jesus, the man who came down from heaven, that's the same guy that went back up to heaven. And why did he do that? Why did he come down to heaven and why did he go back to heaven? Look what it says. It says, so that he might fill all things. And certainly that includes us. He wants to fill us with everything we truly need. And to that end, it says he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, and some as teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of Man to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. God has given us His people and organized us in such a way and given us directions in such a fashion that if we'll just, if we'll just do what God says, we'll have everything we need. He, he wants to fill all to the fullness that he has himself. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, a familiar passage, talks about how we've been given scripture to thoroughly equip us for what? 
every good work. You don't, there's nothing you don't have that you need from God to be fully satisfied. In Romans 8 and 28, it talks there again about a very common understood thing that if we love God, then all things are going to work together for good. So we, we've got a God who set up and, organ, and organized his people in such a fashion that they've got everything they need. All they got to do is follow the directions. All they got to do is follow the directions. And if, and if we'll do that, our obedience combined with the Holy Spirit of God working behind the scenes through his providence, his providence, what we will do is we'll find ourselves blessed and happy. Really, what that's what that word means in the Beatitude. When it talks about blessed are the meek, for they shall see God, and those kind of things. You know the Beatitudes. We'll talk about those in a little while. All of them are prefaced with the idea of blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who suffer in righteousness. The word blessed means happy. It means happy. And basically what God has done, he's provided, he's made provision so that, that we've got everything, we got everything we need. Nothing, nothing at all is lacking. And so if we'll, if we'll do what we're supposed to do, God behind the scenes will help us and, and things will work out for good now and forever. We'll increasingly become happier and more fulfilled if we'll just let go and let God. So we've talked about his, 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 his penchant. We've talked about his provision. Now let's talk about his power. Let's talk about his power. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. That's the power of God. Sometimes you might say, okay, he wants to make me happy. He's provided the means. But, you know, can he, can he really do it? Can he really do it? I mean, look, folks, he might be able to make you happy, but I'm so miserable. I'm so far beyond the pale. I've done so much wrong that even, even God can't give me what I need. Wrong. You know, if, if, if God could take Saul of Tarsus and make him into what he became, imagine what Jesus could have done with Judas if Judas would have just repented of his sins instead of killing himself because of his misery. It says in this passage, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. And time won't allow a thorough discussion of all of these things. They're in the attitude, they're in the outlines. But the scripture makes it very clear that God is, is stronger than our weakness. And we'll look at this one to illustrate the rest. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. You know, sometimes we're weak. We're just not spiritually strong. And, and we sit there and say, how can God take somebody so impotent and powerless as me and, and turn me into this well-watered garden that overflowing and, and satisfying other people too? How, how could God do that with me? He, the answer is he can. If we have faith as a mustard seed, if we just give God whatever we got, it's enough if you'll trust him and do what he says. Notice what it says there in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. My, this is Jesus talking to Paul, who wanted this thorn in the flesh to be taken away from him. And Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. You see, what often happens is that God takes the wisdom of the world and turns it upside down. We sit there and we say, I, God can't help me, I'm too weak. It's the fact that you recognize your weakness is what gives God the power to do something with you. Why are so many people miserable? Because they think they can do it themselves. They don't need God. They're strong enough on their own. And what they don't recognize is they're horribly, miserably weak. They can't do it with God. And so if you admit you're weak, that, that enables you to have the power of God in your life. 
So don't think of weakness as, as a negative thing. If you recognize it and turn to God for strength, you can be made strong. And we can talk about other things. Weariness. You know, sometimes we get tired. We just get worn out. And I know I need to do all these things, but I'm just so tired. God is stronger, more powerful than any fatigue you'll ever have. Again, I wish, well, I'll go ahead and read Isaiah 40, 28. These verses are just so good. Isaiah 40, 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. He said, though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous, young men stumble badly. Notice this. Yet those who wait for the Lord, they will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. There's a difference between physical fatigue and spiritual fatigue. Just because we're worn out physically does not mean the inward man cannot be being renewed and growing day by day. And what God is saying to us is don't equate physical fatigue and spiritual fatigue. You're never too tired for God to take you and make you spiritually strong. He can give you rest. He can refresh you. He can renew you. He can arm you for the battle that you need to fight tomorrow if you'll, if you'll serve Him today and go to bed and rest at peace with Him. He's greater than our poverty, Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. He's greater than any persecution might endure. The bottom line is that Jesus Christ has got power that is greater than anything that might stand between us and being fulfilled. So that's the third P, His power. So we, we know that God, His penchant, His desire is for us to be fulfilled. We know that He's provided everything that we need to that end. We know that He's got the power to make it happen. Even we can't mess it up if we'll just believe and obey Him. He's more powerful than us. He's more powerful than anything. Believe in God. But number four is proof, is His proof. God does not just sit there and say, I, I, I want this. I've provided for it. I can do it. He, he gives us proof that He's done it. He, he's done it with others. He'll do it with us. Look at Psalm 107, verse 9. Psalm 107, verse 9. It says that he has satisfied the thirsty soul. It's not some pie in the sky theoretical thing that only happens to superhuman Christians. It's something that ha can happen to anybody who will walk by faith in him. And it's not something that might happen. It's something that has happened. It says he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. I'll just give you a little list that you can look at the verses later in your own time. But it talks about how he, he fulfilled Abraham. He satisfied the children of Israel in the wilderness. He satisfied David. He satisfied Mary. He satisfied the 4,000. He took care of the apostles on the limited commission. He took care of the early disciples. He took care of the Corinthians. And he took care of Paul. God is not somebody who just speaks theory he says here's the proof if i've done all these things for abraham the children of israel david mary four thousand people the apostles the early disciples the corinthians paul if i can do these things for them and i have i can do it for you so you got his penchant his desire you got his provision you got his power you got his proof you got a couple of other things you got his petition number five his petition. Look at Isaiah 55 verses 1 and 2. This is a powerful verse. A powerful verse. The God of heaven. The God of heaven. Here is his personal invitation to each and every one of us. Are you weak and heavy laden? Here's God's invitation. Isaiah 55 1. Ho! Everyone who thirsts, come to the water. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. We sit there and go, I'm dying of thirst. God says, hey, come drink at my table. 
I got no money to do that. I don't deserve that kind of place. You who have no money, come and buy and eat. Come and buy wine and milk without money and without cost. You don't have to. You don't have to pay for what I give you. Just sit down because I want to give it to you. I'm not going to force it on you. I'm not going to take you and force you to sit down and stuff this stuff down your throat. But I'm inviting you to sit at my table. No, you don't deserve a place at it. But you know what? You can have a place if you'll just sit down. And I'll feed you. And you will become overflowing. He says to them, Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Here is the petition of Jesus Christ. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. You famishing, you weary, come and thou shalt be richly fed. When God made us, He understands that he is our Father and we are His children. And that's true of every human being. We spend a lot of time talking about the children of God being Christians, and they are, and they're a special, they're a special breed, so to speak. But every human being is a child of God, who God loves as much as He loves any other child of God, whether a Christian or not. It's remarkable to think this, but you know what? God loved Adolf Hitler as much as He loves Tim Norton. He loves us. He does He's He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he invites everybody, anybody, to come and sit at his table and let and let him feed us with, with what we'll never deserve to consume, but in consuming it, we will find fulfillment that is beyond our wildest imagination. And the final P is this, our portion. Our portion. If, you thought, if, you, if you've ever heard the word portion, the, the picture of it is this. When people would go out and win a battle, the victors would divide the spoils. And whatever fell to a particular person, that was their portion. Their portion of the spoils of war. God is the only thing we need to get out of life. In the battle that we're fighting all the time between good and evil, what is the only thing that I need to have when this life is over? God. Look at Psalm 73, 25. Psalm 73, 25. The latter part of the verse says this. Besides you, I desire nothing on earth. That's the psalmist talking to God. He says, the only thing I desire on earth is a relationship with you. Then look at verse 26. Look at verse 26. The latter part of that verse says, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God is the only thing we need in this life. And if when, when this life is over, if the only thing we have is God, we got it all. Now I want to direct you to a couple of amazing verses. Look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 9. Deuteronomy 32, verse 9. Not only is God the only thing we need to get out of this life, but you know what? We are God's portion. The only thing that God wants out of this world that He's created, you know, He's spoken from this, from everything we see, it came from nothing. He spoke and there was nothing and everything we know came into existence. By the same word, everything we know physical, is going to burn, it's going to perish, it's going to disappear. And what are we going to be left with? Well, the only thing that we, we better have is God. God is our portion. Now, when it's said and done, what is the only thing that God wants out of this world that He's created so amazingly? He went to the, to the falls, Niagara Falls today. And that just just says again there's a God and whoever says there's not one is a fool. Why did he, why did he do all of this? Why, why did he make all this stuff? Why did he go to such trouble? It's because he wanted us to be with him in heaven. God is our portion. We are his portion. That's an amazing thought. Look at Deuteronomy 32.9. 
It says the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. The only thing that God wants out of this life is us. And the final verse along these lines we'll look at is Ephesians 1.23. And with this we'll finish the six P's. And then we'll make some other points. Notice Ephesians chapter 1 verse 23. Talking about his body, the people of God, his faithful children. He says that his people is the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's amazing. We understand how God is our fullness. How God is all we need out of this life. He's our portion. How he can and wants to fill all in all. But this passage is saying to us, you are so important to God. That not only is he your all in all, but we are his all in all. The body of Christ is the fullness of him who fills all in all. When he says to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And he takes us and introduces us to his father. He will complete what he set out to do. It will be finished. It will be fulfilled. Jesus will have out of this life what he intended to receive an eternal relationship with those who want to have an eternal relationship with him. So it's amazing to me to think that that not only is God all I, I need in this life, and I should forsake everything in life so that I always have him, but it's amazing to me to think that the only thing that he wants out of this life is a relationship with me. He loves me that much. So a lot of us are missing something. We're, we're dry. We're thirsty. What we're missing is God, and that's what we talked about last night. But if we have God, we have it all. We are complete in Him. So let's make some applications. So whoever we are, are we allowing God to make us whole? Apply this lesson. Are we finding the contentment, the blessedness, the satisfaction, the fulfillment, the joy, the peace, the abundant life that everyone is so desperately seeking but which can only be found in Jesus? Does, are we are we seeking and finding the fulfillment that this sermon says we can have? Are we doing that? If we're being honest with ourselves, I think most of us would have to say no. We'd have to admit that what was true, true of the children of Israel in, in, in Jeremiah's day is just as true of the children of God in our day. Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 10 says, From the least even to the greatest, everyone is greedy for gain. We'll talk about covetousness tomorrow night. Most of us are not seeking satisfaction with God. We want Him, but we want more than Him. And it's that more than Him that we want that cuts us off from the satisfaction that we can have if we'll just admit we don't need anything more than Him. Are we seeking the fulfillment in the way God says? How many of us can... Say sincerely, I have life and I have it more abundantly. Can you say that? Can you say we do all things without grumbling because we rejoice in the Lord always? Can we say we're anxious for nothing because we have the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension? Can we say we don't let the sun go down on our wrath, but we rather pray as follows for those who sin against us. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can we honestly say those things? And if not, brethren... We're not letting the fullness of him fill all in all. We make some lofty claims in the songs we sing. I mean, we did a lesson on lying not too long ago. And the point was made, you know, Christians typically are not prolific liars except when they sing hymns to God. Because a lot of times, I don't know about you, but some of those statements that those songs sang are pretty lofty statements. And are they really true of us? give you some examples here's some songs that we sing all that i need is you jesus all that i need is you from early in the morning to late at night all that i need is you is, is that really the way we feel do we go to bed at night perfectly content because i got jesus and i don't need anything else i want you more than gold or silver only you can satisfy do we do we really do we really mean that when i am dry you fill my cup you are my all in all really I've got joy like a fountain. We should, do we? 
And here's one that just tears at a heart if you think about what it says and whether or not we really mean it. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. When we ask believers today how they're doing spiritually, what kind of response do we typically get? Well, you know, this thing is bad and that thing is bad. This thing could be better. And so and so over here is saying these things. You ask people how they're doing and you get a litany, litany of, of negative responses. Typically, that's true. I, I, I know this is me a lot of times. What should the answer be? What should the answer be? Somebody comes up to you and says, how are you doing? Let me adapt Psalm 23 to what this lesson is really teaching us. How am I doing? This is what we ought to do. How am I doing? The Lord is my shepherd. I'm never going to want for anything. He richly provides me spiritual food, water, and rest. He restores my soul, and then He continues to guide me in the paths of righteousness. And He does these things not because of who I am, but because of who He is. I deserve, I deserve damnation. He gives me salvation. How am I doing? Even when the paths of righteousness lead me through times of darkness and death, I don't fear any evil because God is with me. He's more powerful than all my foes and He's constantly watching over me. Such thoughts fill me with so much comfort that I never cower before my enemies but always glorify God in their presence. How am I doing? God is so good to me and He loves me so much that my cup overflows and it's going to remain that way for the rest of my life on earth. And when I die, I will go to heaven and be with my Lord forever. How am I doing? Why do you ask? It is obvious in everything I say and do. That's the way we ought to answer the question. How am I doing? Because that is the answer we can give if we'll just trust and obey Jesus. So brethren, we need to get urgent about being complete in Christ. It's not an option. It's an absolute necessity. In Philippians 4 and verse 4, this is not a mere suggestion. This is a command of God. Rejoice in the Lord always. And if you missed it, again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice is the standing orders of a Christian. We need to be happy. We need to be fulfilled. We need to appreciate that if we have God, we've got everything and be on top of the world as we ought to be. This is serious business. As I've already said, it's not about us, but it's about glorifying God and attracting others to Him. In Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5 verse 3, this will be the final verse. It says, happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You want to be happy? Be humble. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You want to be happy? Feel bad about your sins. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. You want to, you want to be happy? Then allow God to control your life. Swallow your pride. Yield your strength to the most powerful force in the world who is infinitely stronger than you. You want to be happy? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. If you want to be happy, go to the fount of living waters and drink and drink deeply, and you'll be filled. Blessed or happy are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You want to be happy? Then learn what mercy is. It's one of the weightier matters of the law. And sadly, I think there's a lot of Christians who don't know what compassion is if it comes and just smack them across the head. You want to be happy, you got to understand what mercy or compassion is. You want to be happy, be pure in heart because you're going to see God. You want to be happy, be a peacemaker for they shall be called sons of God. And you want to be happy, notice this. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because, because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets 
who were before you. You want to be happy? Go out and let people beat you up because you're a faithful child of God. Sounds contradictory, doesn't it? It takes the world's wisdom and turns it on its end. But oftentimes what's true is the exact opposite of what the world thinks. And that's why we got to believe and obey Jesus to be fulfilled. Now you got this wonderful passage. Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. Happy, 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 happy. But what's it really all about? Is it about us? No, read on. Look at verse 13. Why should we be happy? It's because you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by underfoot by men. We, I don't know about you, but I, I love salt. Tammy says I love it way too much. It just makes food taste really good. And if you if you really want some seasoning, get Tony Sachery's Cajun seasoning. Man, that stuff is good. It just it just makes eating so much more joy. We need to be the salt or the Tony Sachery's of the world. We need to be the kind of people that'll say, hmm, that looks interesting. I might give that a try. And after they follow in our footsteps, they glorify God who is in heaven. Look at verse 14. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill. Nor does anyone lamp, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. You're the light of the world. It is our responsibility to show the world that there is a better way. And we were talking today about why are churches of Christ shrinking. There's a lot of explanations for that. But one of them, I think, and one of the most major ones is the fact that we're not being the salt of the earth that we ought to be. We're not being the lights that we ought to be. We're compromising. We're, 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 we're basking in our pity and our sorrow and we're, we're not understanding that in Christ we have all that we need and living consistent with that knowledge. If we would get on fire for the Lord because of what the Lord is doing for us, I think we'd be saving souls so much more than we are now. I remember, it would be hard to believe this, but when I was 36 years old, I was a little overweight, and we had a preacher stay with us for a gospel meeting in Louisiana. And he every day would go out and exercise, and he was just... He was just ugly, mean. He was a mean guy because he would not leave the house until I went with him to exercise and he would not take no for an answer. And it turned out to be one of the greatest blessings I ever had physically because after he left, I kept doing it. I lost a lot of weight. And I, for a while there, I was so I, I was so transformed by exercise. It was such a blessing to me. I felt so good that basically, if you were around me, you were going to hear about exercise whether you wanted to hear about it or not. Why don't we talk to about Jesus with people more? It's because we're not sold on Jesus as fully as we ought to be. If, if somebody or something is doing something powerfully good for you, you're going to share it with others. And that's why we need to be complete in Christ. Because if we're complete in Christ, we're not going to have to listen to lessons that teach to teach us, to tell us, go out there and share Jesus with others. You're going to do that naturally. You can't help but do that. And that's what being a light is all about. It says, let your light, verse 16, shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father who is in Him. If we're not complete in Christ, we need to desperately recognize that we need to repent of being discontented, being unhappy and dissatisfied. We need to be reconciled with God. And then we need to begin acting like people who have it all. Now, let me, let me, let me emphasize this we need to begin acting like people who have it all because we serve a God who can and wants to fill all it all good news good news there's a petition out there this is a great petition all things are ready come to the feast come for the table now is spread you famishing, you weary come, and you will be rich. We're inviting you to sit down at the table of God and eat. If you're not a Christian, the way you sit down at the table and start eating is by becoming one. If you've heard the word of God and you choose to believe it is true, 
and you are willing to confess that belief before men, then if you will repent of your sins, you will turn away from darkness to light. You'll say, from now on, Lord, it's not my will, but your will be done. If you'll do those things and then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, you sit down at the table and you start eating. And what you got to do to get increasingly more and more fulfilled is to keep on eating. So if you've never sat down at the table before, do those things. Belief is a change of your intellect. Confession is a change is a, is a change of your loyalty. You can't be a closet Christian. Repentance is a change of your will, and baptism is a change of your state. You go from someone who's lost to someone who's saved to somebody who's out there eating at all kinds of tables, but not eating at the only one that's really going to fulfill them. So if you obey God's first law of pardon, as we've just outlined, you're at the table. You're eating. You're growing. And if you will keep on doing the things God says to stay at that table and keep on eating, you will be increasingly blessed. But it's hard. You know, living the Christian life can sometimes be difficult. And we do get weary and we do get tired and we get overwhelmed and we need help. And we find that help in prayer. We find that help in reading scripture. But we also find that help in one another. So if you're here and you're weary and you're heavy laden, let us know that so that we can help you keep on keeping on. So you don't get up from that table and go try to find satisfaction in something else. But if, if you've done that, and that happens a lot of times. People will become Christians. They'll sit out at God's table. They'll eat for a while, and then they find they're not satisfied. And so what's the problem? Well, obviously the problem is God's food doesn't work. No, that wasn't the problem. The problem was you weren't eating what he said the way he said for you to eat. So if you've, if you've gotten up and, again, are eating at other tables, come back home. Repent of your sins. Believe and obey God. Don't be like Solomon and have to go out there and wallow in the mire once again to be reminded that sin is, is filth and righteousness is glory. Come home. Be where you know you ought to be. The bottom line is this. If we miss heaven, we've missed it all. And if we are so living that heaven is our home, we, we've got it all in Christ Jesus. I'm not ashamed.